So Michael, both you and I exist in kind of this brave new world of journalism that we seem to find ourselves in. It's a, it's a funny time to be talking about sensitive issues and you know, over the last couple of, I mean I guess it's the last six months, I think that we've learned a lot about what governments around the world think of journalists actually acting like journalists. You know, I mean, uh, you, you you're not talk supposed about, to do that. Yeah, I know, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you talk about more extreme things than I do. You know, we focus on digital yeah. currency, and that certainly is a controversial topic, but you're out there, you know, button heads with, with some meaningful Pretty things. much anybody, yeah. I mean, yeah, exactly. I, you know, just because it's, uh, you know, I, ju I just feel like when most people realize what's going on, they will be, enough will be motivated to act once they really know about it in their own little way, and that's how, you, ch you know, that's how the world changes. Right. So, I mean, you're talking, so, so, now, uh, yesterday, I believe, um, Mr. Uh, Bradley Manning was acquitted, and actually, that was a little bit surprising to me. Well, I have to say, well, no, I mean, he was, he no? was, no, he was, he was, uh, he was, he was not, he was found not guilty for aiding the enemy, which, ah, which, see, which was see. a big deal, yes. um, and that was the fear that most people had, the biggest fear, because that basically meant that if you, if you release any information, that then the government claims. Um, aided, like someone. Hey, look, if you, anything that's on the internet can be. Well, can you explain with, the argument for yeah. a second? So, here's a, so basically, the, the the threat was this: was that they were saying that because Bradley Manning released um, sensitive information uh, to Wiki, WikiLeaks, which was then released onto the World Wide Web, that because Al Qaeda, <laughs> whatever that is, can find this information on the internet, he aided the enemy. So which 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 could mean that you know basically anything that you put on the internet that is then read by someone that the United States deems an enemy is aiding the enemy. So basically anyone could be charged with aiding the enemy and convicted and thrown in jail for just putting stuff on the internet and that the U.S. government doesn't like. And that's not a small Terrible. charge. No, that's that's, so, a, right. that's, that's, a, that's that's a pretty that's, meaningful. That's very thing. aggressive. So yeah. so um, so that would have been horrible. That would have been like the worst case scenario. So that didn't happen. So that's okay. good. Um, now the bad thing is, I believe he still faces with all the other um, essentially convictions. He already pled guilty to I think ten counts. Or I see. I see. All, right off the bat, he pled guilty to certain things. He, he didn't agree with you know that he aided the enemy. So he still faces a long, long time in jail. I think he might even be a hundred years in jail. So we you know that we still don't know exactly what's how that's going to play out. So it was you know there's there's still a lot of bad things about this, considering the fact that you know James Clapper, the head of the director of national intelligence perjured himself in front of Congress regarding the NSA uh, spying programs. It's, everyone knows he lied in front of Congress, and he's not getting in any sort of trouble for that, for, for violating the Fourth Amendment. And Bradley Manning is, is, is going back to jail, basically, it looks like. So that's, that's still really bad. So, you know, we've been... Uh, it has seemed to me that, like, over the last couple of years, we, we found ourselves in a compounding situation. This is not specifically about journalism, but it does touch on it. Uh, where because certain people can't go to jail, mm -hmm. it means that you have to almost stop paying attention to or even considering certain actions that used to be criminal from being criminal. Yeah. Because if you applied that standard unevenly, it becomes obvious, mm -hmm. but if you just ignore it entirely saying that there's no evidence, then maybe you can get away. I mean, do you think that that game goes on for much longer? Because it seems like fraud is, you know, to a certain extent, not going punished. Oh, I yeah. mean, it, what, really what we have going on here, it's crazy. It's like these extremes where the, the, the sort of connected class, let's say, um, I call them the oligarchs, you can call them the plutocrats, whatever you want to, whatever you want to call them, the, the, you know, the D, I, sometimes I call it the military industrial Wall Street complex, right? You know, so it's, and then it's everywhere in, in Washington, D.C., and the defense contractors, and we were talking about this just yesterday as a discussion, like Booz Allen Hamilton, you know, 99% of their revenue comes directly from the federal government. How is that a private company? Right? Right. It's not. It's, 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 they call it a private company, which means that they don't have to, you know, they're, they're not, um, they don't have requirements that a government agency would have but they get all their money from the government. And so they're going wild. And so a lot of defense contractors are like that. So it's this, it's this group of people that are above the law. And not only are they above the law, but because they know they are, they're above the law, then they just c commit more and more and more egregious acts because no one gets in trouble. Um, but on the other side, you know, a regular citizen can almost, can't even like chew gum anymore without go getting in trouble. And this lawyer put out, a, a, a famous attorney put out an article, which I, I highlighted once, that said every American basically commits an average of three felonies a day. So if they want to go after you, for whatever reason, it's pretty easy to do so. And they're doing it now. 
I mean, a kid, a kid the other day I was talking about, he was in, he was in jail for a Facebook post. Right. Yeah, so, we've been seeing yeah, more things like exactly. that where it seems like so 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 on the one hand, it's getting to be way easier to get in trouble for things that used to be considered pretty much protected free speech. Exactly. And on the other hand, you know, you've got journalists who who can't do their job because right. of this problem. And on the other hand, you've got people who are committing what used to be capital crimes right. and there's not even prosecution of them. Exactly. So it's 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 you're getting it's becoming extreme on both sides. And yeah, something will give at some point. So and what does that look like? I mean, like, what what are some potential it gives scenario? Well, I think the main I think the main thing that's kept si the situation calm in the United States so far is 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 basically, and this is what I call when people knock food stamps. And don't get me wrong, I, I don't think it's it's a good thing to have you know the forty something million people on food stamps. Obviously, a bad reflection of society. But when people knock it, it's like, oh, these food stamp people. No, it's just a systematic. Um, these people are victims, right? And what they're what's being done is they are very intentionally being kept uh, on the edge of subsistence, right? Through government supplements to to basically pay off pay them off against civil disobedience or, right. or unrest, right? So you've got this gigantic class that a victim class, I would say, that's on food stamps or other forms of, of welfare to to buy off their essentially quiet uh, peace and quiet. But that, in my opinion, can only go on so long. And what's allowing that to continue more than anything else is our military and the petrodollar, which allows the, the U.S. currency to continue to buy goods and services without creating goods and services in return. We're just creating dollars and we're buying oil with it. And so we protect that with our military. And so as long as, as, long as essentially the, the, the dollar is functioning in the way it's functioning, um, the, the, the people can be quelled. But that can't last forever. And so at some point, m my feeling is you're going to have a situation where the welfare warfare state becomes so large, so corrupt that it falls apart, disintegrates. Now, my hope, and I think yours as well, which is what we're all trying to do here, is that we can create an alternative parallel economy and society in this time period that we have now, so that when that one falls apart, there's something here. Like Bitcoin, that's what made me feel really excited about Bitcoin when I first heard about it because I said to myself, okay, my biggest fear was a dollar collapse and everyone's going to panic and there's going to be nothing else and they're going to shove down an SDR right. or some other central bank cabal currency on us, one world currency we don't want. Whereas with Bitcoin, at least, I know that the, there's the, we, right now the infrastructure is there to just move to something else. It already exists and that's a very good thing, I think. Right. You know, it's a funny time to be a journalist. Uh, it seems like like with the culture of journalism and the culture of especially corporate journalism mm -hmm. there's a tendency to report on things that frankly don't matter at all mm -hmm. rather than things that matter a lot because right. the things that don't matter at all you know i mean they're they're easy they're they're safe mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so you know again we've uh, with with the recent uh the wiretapping specifically of journalists who had been reporting on things that were not considered kosher as far as you know the government is concerned it's it's a I, I'm very curious. Again, you you expose yourself a lot to this, and you're, yeah. you're out there as an independent platform. Yep. So I mean, what what's your take on all of this? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think I think there's a few things that are going on here. I mean, um, f first of all, what really worried me in the aftermath of Edward Snowden was how immediately you, I always look for the memes, right? The mainstream media, like what are they saying? What, how are they trying to position the argument? And the way they were trying to position the argument right away was Glenn Greenwald's not a journalist. Glenn Greenwald is an activist. Okay. Well, one of my favorite quotes about journalism, and it's attributed to various people, but is in a nutshell, this embodies it. And it's, it goes something like, um, journalism is exposing something that power, the powerful don't want exposed. Everything else is PR. Right. Which, is, which I think is right. Um, and so that's journalism. And so what Glenn Greenwald did is clearly journalism. And, uh, and, and so what a lot, of these, a lot of these folks have been trying to do is not only demonize Glenn Greenwald, calling him an activist and not a journalist. Um, I mean, if that's the case, we need more activists and less journalists. Right, but yeah. but, but, um, but what, they, what now they're trying to do is, 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 is define journalist, right? So say like, you, okay, well, who's a journalist? The government wants to decide who's a journalist. Like, they're going to create these bills to protect journalists. Sounds great, but who's a journalist? Right. Who decides what a journalist is? And so the key, the key thing I think you know, all, all of your audience needs to be aware of, that everyone needs to be aware of, is the fact that it doesn't matter who is a journalist. It matters acts of journalism are what matter. 
right. and acts of journalism fall into what, for sure, what I described earlier is an act of journalism. For, right. sure, for sure, what Glenn Greenwald did is an act of journalism. So it doesn't matter whether he has a little tag that says journalist, right? It's the act, right? right? It's, we defend freedom of speech. We defend freedom of the press. We don't defend individuals specifically right. designed to play that role in society because if you do that, then you're obviously going to have, you're going to handpick the biggest lackeys Right, around. exactly. So, so yeah. you know, you, you mentioned the shield laws that have been getting a lot right. of talk about. It's a, it's a funny thing, you know, uh, <laughs> Article 1 of the Constitution says, Congress shall make no law mm -hmm. with regards right. to... Right, And so, right. so on its face, right. a shield law mm -hmm. seems kind of... Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's like all these laws, it's like all these laws, right? I mean, I was, I was reading this quote from Orwell, you know, 1984 the other day, and it said, you know, one of the best lines was the Ministry of Truth is associated with lies. The Ministry of Peace is associated with war. You know, it's like whenever you hear these acts, they're always the opposite of what you think. Like right. a whistleblower protection act is guaranteed to, right. to, to, to hurt whistleblowers. Right. You can be sure of that. So, you know, I mean, on the subject of whistleblowers, we've, had, we've seen Edward Snowden come out, and it seems like he might be the first of more to come. And again, it just seems like the, the way the system is designed now, if you have any sort of morals, it's very difficult to go along with, with enabling these systems, mm -hmm. especially at a system administrator level. I think that's really kind of the interesting part, is that these system administrators tend to be in these positions of power, mm -hmm. not because they've shown themselves to be incredibly trustworthy, but right. rather because they have the skills in order right. to pull out the technical sure. stuff. So, so, but a lot of times in those positions, you wind up with, with people who ideologically don't necessarily mesh that well, as it right. seems Snowden did not. Right. So I mean, like, do you think that, so, can you put the can you put the genie back in the bottle on this? Or yeah, I'm, I mean, look, I, I've said this before, and and I and nothing that I've seen recently makes me feel any different, which is I'm very optimistic, you know, and I'm not. That's not to say that it's going to be like everything's going to be great tomorrow or next year, but it means that I think that like the tide and the affairs of men that like we're floating on now is is one towards again decentralization and empowering the individual, empowering communities, rather than. You know, I think we've sort of hit peak centralization, um, political centralization, economic centralization. And it's not that it's falling apart visibly right now. Like when we look around, we're saying, oh, it's worse. It's getting worse. But under the surface, so much is happening and so many bright minds are working hard to change that and empower the individual um, to do to live how they want, to create how they want, whether it's like non-GMO backlash, you know, all this stuff. And, uh, and also, you know, if you look at recent polls that have come out, um, the younger generation is so adamantly anti, you know, a lot of these things that the establishment wants. If you look at, even if you look at the Amash Amendment, right, which, which recently, oh, it almost passed, scared the living daylight. I'm not the, familiar with the Amash Amendment. Okay, please. so the Amash Amendment was, uh, was Justin Amash, who's a Republican, libertarian-minded um, congressman, House of Rep Representative from the state of Michigan. He put forth a, a bill, and it was co-sponsored by John Conyers, also of Michigan, who's uh, been there, I think, 25 terms right. forever. Um, and he's a Democrat, so uh, it, was, it was bipartisan. And what this did was it, it, it focused on Section 215 of the Patriot Act, um, and it would have required warrants, or essentially target, you know, you need to target a specific person to get phone records and all that. That's shocking. It means, <laughs> it seems like we already have that in the Constitution, but um, it, was, it, was, uh, it was a very important bill. So. So this, uh, surprisingly, everyone thought when he, fir when he first went for this thing that it was, there's no chance it could pass, right? No chance. It was, it, was, it was about to pass. And then the day before, or the day of the vote, the NSA held a secret meeting with um, Democrat and Republican leaders to convince them to vote against it. And that worked. Now, so 13 representatives that had been opposed to, and I wrote a post on this showing how, the hypocrisy, opposed to the Patriot Act, opposed to Section 215 of the Patriot Act, um, in the past, publicly. Given the opportunity. Like publicly, right. Yeah. When, when the bill was actually in front of them, this bill, they voted against it because of pressure, right? Because of pressure. And so, but the, but the great thing about this is that if you look at the people that voted for it, you look at the people who voted against it, the no's, right, which stopped it, it was all the, the, the it was, it's the establishment players on both sides. It was the, it was the Pelosi's, it was the John Boehner's, it was, it was these guys that have been there forever, they're protecting their turf, they're not thinking forward, they're older in a lot of cases, um, or maybe age really isn't the thing here, but it's more like the establishment. The real establishment, Democrat and Republicans voted no. But the fact that it came so close to passing, that's amazing. I mean, n n n national, you know, issues of national security and defense and spying and all that stuff, never get a vote like that. Right. So just the fact, the fact it came up for a vote and almost passed is an incredible sign. 
and uh, and I think it's great. So, I mean, the natural question here is, do you think that given where we are now, we can actually walk this back? Uh, I, I think we, well, I think we always can walk things back. But I think, uh, I, I think from, from my perspective, um, you know, anybody that's out there that cares about these issues needs to think about it from the, from, the, uh, from the perspective of what are you good at? What is your skill? You know, for me, I feel like, and I think you're in the same boat, you know, we're communicators. Um, we have our areas of expertise and we're trying to communicate with people out there what we know. Um, that's what we do, right? We're not, I don't want to run for Congress, right? right? But, you know, I wouldn't tell somebody that does have political skills or, 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 or does like doing legislation, which I wouldn't, <laughs> to go run for, for Congress. Because right. look at what Amash did. He's 33 years old. Right. You know, so, so if we get more, of, more people like him in there um, doing that, pushing the buttons, we basically need to pressure the system nudge the system, avoid the system, fight the system in every single possible way. State level, federal level, Bitcoin level, 3D printing level, blogging level, everything. And, and eventually we'll win. And, and, I, and I really believe that. Well, I think that that's a, that's a good outlook and I certainly hope that that's the world we wind up living in. <laughs> that in a will be years. too. <laughs> Otherwise I'll see you in South America. Yeah, something. exactly, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, um, Michael Krieger, thank you very much yeah. for being on Let's Talk Bitcoin, and we'll see you next time. All right. Thank you.